Welcome everyone to this last breakout session of the ECHO International Agriculture Conference. We're gonna get started in just about two minutes, but I wanna welcome you in, invite you to get settled, grab a drink. We're excited to hear from John Leary and ask some more of your questions that are gonna be presented here in this uh, Meet the Speaker Q&A session. So let me point you to the right side of your screen if you're on a computer. The Q&A panel is where you can ask your own questions or you can vote for previous questions that have been asked and you can have discussion on those questions as well if you have a, you know, a context or something you'd like to add to that question. We will be prioritizing the questions based on your input. We'd love this to be an interactive session and we want to stay connected to you and how this benefits you as practitioners. So I also wanna point out the Whova chat. That is where you can tell us if you are not hearing the audio or having trouble with any of the technologies going on today. Uh, we'd love to have our teammates help you get reconnected in the chat and then we'll continue on. And we're excited today to be joined by John Leary. A great he pleasure. Is the executive, executive director of Trees for the Future, new friend of mine, and also we posted the link, uh, the Echo Community link in the chat to his book. Um, John's book is called One Shot Trees for Our Last Chance of Survival. And it's just exciting to be able to have the platform to share about forest gardening, agroforestry is gaining in awareness, I think, in our communities. Um, and also the need for it is rampant around the world. So John, we're so grateful that you're here. Thanks for uh, geeking out with, about this with us. And um, yeah, we are excited to hear what you're gonna share with all of our participants. It's a, you know, it's such a great pleasure to be here, to be back again. And, and I do wish we were all face-to-face, -face. we all do. I'll, I'll, we'll hopefully see you all next, face-to-face -face next year. But um, what, a, what, a, what a great time it is to be able to come together. Uh, we just had COP 26 happen in Europe and um, you know I think all indications are that exactly in my in my presentation here the the planet needs us and I'm so happy to be here with all of you practitioners and everybody who's working to end hunger and to restore landscape so I'm excited to be here I got a little bit of a taste of some of the questions that people have and I'm, I'm looking forward where we can take this today um, we, we we are out of time and I, I, I really appreciate how all of you are, you know, getting dirty. We say, let's get planting and we're um, getting trees planted by the millions, the tens of millions, the hundreds of millions. Um, we're learning as we go. And we have so many great things to share here too. So um, Danielle, I'm happy to recap a little bit about some of the, 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 the five points of, of restoring tree cover, just to kind of, you know, prompt people a little bit. And then, and then maybe we can get into some of the deeper questions that they have, because we've been able to work for 30 years across a lot of different contexts and learn what's been learned working in Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia. So I, I think these guidelines are a, a good place to start. We, uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll quickly run through them again, and I, I hope everybody was able to capture them in the presentation. The first about, you can't just grow what was there. You know, we're talking about restoring landscapes and people oftentimes might think that tree planting is easy and whatever it used to be, we can go and just plant it again. Um, and I, I feel like the, a lot of the hardwoods that we see, for example, in West Africa that grew up when the forest, when there was a forest there, when the landscape was shaded and covered, um, uh, it, it, you know, they grew up in the shade, um, they are new species that kind of evolved in, in that type of situation. And now with uh, what agriculture has done to these landscapes, stripping the trees, the growing conditions have certainly changed. And so uh, a lot of the agroforestry techniques that we use are working in these really difficult growing conditions to, to start growing things again, or to start growing diverse things again, because very few things are actually growing. And uh, you might not be able to grow what used to be there, but in our step-by-step, -step, when you grow the pioneer trees and you cool off the land, you can start to see a return of natural biodiversity. Seeds will start regenerating again, or things that used to grow there are gonna be more easily planted. And I think there was gonna be a follow-up question about the shea. 
the Shea in, in Africa, which we're not, Trees for the Future, we're not immediately working a lot with. And I'm, I, I'm hoping that we can find more opportunities to do it. But as I talk with producers, kind of like the bush mango, it's not a mango, but it's a bush mango. It's a slow growing hardwood, kind of working with Shea. When you look at the landscape, there's no small Shea trees. There's nothing, you know, smaller than three feet or four feet. There are 50, 7,500 year old ones, but there's nothing small and you don't see the natural regeneration. Uh, when the landscape in Mali, for example, has been heavily degraded, you're not seeing them. You see the goats are chewing on them and everything else. So um, I see people who are just going in and planting certain species, not having much success. And I've heard, uh, but if you can, um, start off and, and we talk about ending hunger in difficult places such as, as Chad, Sudan, searing temperatures. When you can grow the, the pigeon peas, which people are growing in Haiti and which we grow all around the world. When you can grow pigeon peas in a really hot area and start cooling things off, then your tomatoes have a better chance of surviving underneath them. And so trees and, and different things as they grow together, and as we try to reclaim landscapes, I think thinking about how do you use the pioneer species to get in there and to protect so that the stuff that we want to grow has a chance um, is, is a bit of that, the progression that, that we need to time. Um, and all the rest of the, the guidelines here about which trees to plant. And, and I'm curious if anybody has any reactions of the neem, eucalyptus, and um, the pine trees that I, that I talked about today. Um, and I've, I've seen, uh, you know, a lot of people in this community working with tree nurseries and raising seedlings and raising, you know, and if you have any questions about, about seedling propagation as well, I'm happy to, to go there today as well. Um, Market-based agroforestry, thinking about the people, I, I had the fourth and fifth guideline in my, in my top five list today was about really thinking about people. And as you're, as you're connecting with the communities that you're helping, figuring out what are their needs, what are their needs and wants, and finding how to, how to fulfill those through tree planting. Market-based agroforestry really means helping people tie into, you know, value chains, into places to sell things, and ways to make money, and, um, and, and that's such an important part of what we do. It can't just be a, it's not just a do-gooder initiative here. It can't just be a purely environmental initiative. We need it to be sustainable, and we need it all to be economically sustainable as we're working with communities. And so I think this market-based agroforestry help, helps to bridge that. Danielle, agroforestry is a, it seems to be a bit, it's not, it's not new to us, but it's new to the world. And I think as we reach out to new partners, and we just had COP26, and half of the people there don't even know what agroforestry is. You know, and, uh, and other people are producing reports and they, they just don't know. So I think a lot of our challenge here is teaching and educating. Um, there's, there's forests that we can plant trees in the forest and that has its own step-by-step -step and guidelines and forestry management and tree, it's good tree planting. But the lack of that is not why the planet is eroding. The planet is crumbling because our food systems are clearing and degrading. And so it's, it's that agroforestry, it's bringing that forest into the agriculture where I think uh, we really over these, these coming years need to work together to, to, to help, um, help the world know that these solutions exist. Uh, we've put millions of data points on our, our solutions around agroforestry. Uh, I did invite everybody today to join the Forest Garden Training Center, training.trees.org. Um, it's an agroforestry training program. It's for everyone. It's free. It's for you. It's for all of you who are in. There's a certification, and we have millions of data points that say if you do this two years, three years, four years, you can end hunger just as these other people and organizations have been able to end hunger in their communities too. So this is a proven methodology and it entails agroforestry. But then again, Danielle, we need to teach people what is agroforestry to begin with and, and why should I adopt this? So um, we're, uh, we're making good progress, um, I, you know, and uh, making tremendous progress. Um, I think the, the decade of ecosystem restoration um, really gives us a, 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 good, a good opportunity here in these coming years to, to not just plant trees, but as we say, you know, change a lot of lives in the process. 
That's awesome. So let's kind of take it back to the basics. Yeah. Um, what tools and resources would be available for isolating these pioneer species and using choosing the right ones that will work in different contexts? For tree species, you'll find that there's usually about a dozen or two dozen common agroforestry trees. And if you look in the ECHO seed database, and if you look at the trees for the future, uh, we have an orange, if you go to the training.trees.org website I mentioned earlier, um, and you register, there's this orange, I call it the Orange Technical Manual. And there's a chapter in there that has a good breakdown of the common agroforestry trees. Um, it's not all the same trees for every context because we do work throughout the developing world. Um, but what you will find is that there's a lot of common species that are used. Uh, a lot of the good species originally came from Central America, they came from India, they came from different places, but they're somewhat commonly used. And as you, if you're working in a country, it's important to talk to the local forestry office and they always have a, a list of the species that are appropriate to be planted. Um, and what I really found is that's, that's, that, that's usually not a limiting list. The, the, the species I mentioned today, the pine, the eucalyptus and the neem, they're probably on the local appropriate tree planting list. So it hasn't, except for Kenya, where they eliminated, you know, you can't plant eucalyptus within a certain amount of, you know, uh, distance from waterways and things like that. Um, but you do want to check in with that and, um, the, the fast growing trees, it's, it's a small handful of leguminous species and some non nitrogen fixing trees. Um, but there's, an, there's the kind of family of nitrogen fixing trees and, and what a lot of these pioneer species have in common that I'm describing is they'll have some type of pod. Moringa is not a great example, but usually there's some type of pod. There's some type of pod because it's in a bean family. The roots do fix nitrogen into the soil. It's very fast growing. Um, they'll tend to have some type of seed structure that has like seeds in it, like a pod of sorts. They also tend to have leaflets rather than big, broad leaves. So um, you think of a teak leaf as a big leaf, it's bigger than my hand, my head, my face. Um, uh, we're talking about leaflets, real small leaflets that, that when you, uh, if you were to chop the branch or they're, they're, they're messy trees too, the pioneer species, the cespanias, the gliracidias, uh, and else. They're messy trees. They're always hailing down. I have these other trees in my office here. I do have the, these other pioneer species. We always have to sweep up underneath them because they're constantly kind of hailing down different types of things as well. So those are some of the qualities that you're looking for. And the key one from a restoration perspective, and I'll get a little closer to the camera just to underscore it. They tolerate 12 hours of sunlight. And that's not easy because the fruit trees that kind of grew up with a lot of shade when they were young naturally. And usually if you're in the nursery, you learn to put a little bit of a shade on top of your nursery so the trees can sprout up and all. Well, the growing conditions in a degraded area are having, you know, as soon as the sun pops up, it's searing heat and it's going 12 hours a day until sunset. And so these pioneer species can withstand that. Um, and once they do, and they drop down a little bit of the leaf litter, there's more moisture in the topsoil, their roots are fixing nitrogen into the soil, then whether you go in and you wanna plant something that used to be there, it's got a better a hardwood, or you're gonna do the, 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 the shea, you do the bush mango, whatever you're gonna follow up with has, has a better chance of surviving. And you'll also see the return, the natural return of some biodiversity. Well, because there's roots and seeds and the, the bee, not the bees, but the, the birds and the bats are also dropping seeds in there as well. So once you cool off the land, capture more moisture in the soil, you'll start to see more things sprouting as well. So um, there's just more things to think about. It's true. And that brings up kind of the general, if someone's just getting into this and just hearing about your topic, is tree co cover important for restoration and why? Oh, tree cover is pretty essential. I, I think I think the, the, the world started going in the wrong trajectory when, well, in, in a few places, when, when agriculture lost its culture and people started thinking too agribusiness oriented and agriculture started turning into a pretty um, destructive machine. And so is, uh, is tree cover necessary? 
the reason why trees and why restoration and all is, is important is because our food systems are accelerating the degradation of this planet faster than anything's healing. And so it is very important that, that, that we move uh, you know, so, somewhat quickly on it. Um, the, the trees, uh, in addition to providing the free fertilizer, are also providing habitat, they're providing a lot of other ecosystem services. Um, in, in the agroforestry model that, that we have, one of the most important things at first is, uh, I see somebody's a certified, spe uh, certified trainer, that's great. Um, one of the, the real key um, uh, leapfrog points or real transformational agroforestry techniques, as boring as it sounds, is the living fence. And I, I want to point this out because it's, it's really important from a, a restoration point of view, but also just from an income generation point of view. So when you have your average farmer and average plot of land and the land is heavily degraded and the family has been farming the, the same plot for, for many, many years, it's, it's open, it's exposed. And what you usually find is that the same people who are degrading landscapes are also suffering from hunger and poverty. And we're talking about the hundreds of millions of subsistence farmers here. Um, and they're usually involved in peanuts, maize, millet, you know, crops, the cereal crops, mass produced monocrop cereal crops. Um, and I think one way to describe these are poor people crops. And when you think about what does a living fence enable you to do, you say you're planting a living fence, it enables families to start growing things of higher value that they never had the opportunity to do before. So if you can go from peanuts and maize, which you're never gonna rise out of poverty just by being a, a, a peanut farmer or just a maize farmer, if you can protect your field with a living fence, then you can do fruit trees that bring a lot more money. You can do higher value horticulture. You can do, you can do vegetables in, in, in the season um, and you can start making a lot more money. So that living fence, I believe is a real transformational tree planting strategy for your average family in the developing world. Um, but I would also say from an environmental restoration point of view, barbed wire is hard to come by throughout the developing world. Or, or if you get the, the barbed wire, sometimes getting enough posts to mount the barbed wire on these really degraded landscapes is hard to do too, or you, you're running around. Um, if you're able to protect blocks of land with living fences, with thorny rows, uh, the environmental restoration is, is so much faster as well. You've got things growing, you've got natural regeneration. It's easier to plant in these protected areas as well. Um, bit of effort. So I just, I, I think, you know, the question on bringing trees back into the systems, it's absolutely necessary that we find ways to bring trees back into agriculture. And, and as we do, there's a few ways that are really going to help people leapfrog ahead. Uh, so that two or three years from now, they're they're moving on to even more interesting, more complicated tree planting or, or other restoration activities. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And that ties into one of our previous sessions. We were talking about asset-based community development. And if a living fence can be something that people have access to and they can connect, start there, then it will both be, you know, rejuvenating and good for the community. Yeah. So if someone's looking at this, they say, what are some methodologies, methodologies for production of trees on a large scale, um, specifically sub-Saharan Africa? And, you know, how does someone go about developing a tree nursery? In terms of a methodology for tree planting and, or for tree nurseries, here's the guidance I provide on this. And this is what we've learned over 32 years. Um, small backyard nurseries are best. We've done it all. I've done the biggest government nurseries. I've done private sector nurseries. I've seen the coffee company nurseries. I've seen small backyard nurseries. I've seen community nurseries. I've seen group nurseries. I've seen throw the seeds out of an airplane. I've seen drop them from a drone. I've seen grow the bare root seedlings. I've seen every way. And the most cost-effective way to do this, and, and Danielle, our food system has a lot to learn from tree planting and that the most effective and efficient way is to get everybody involved is to have small backyard nurseries. And I, I mentioned earlier in my presentation, I had a picture where 
Uh, the woman had either hundreds or just a couple thousand. We're really talking about an area the size of somebody's desk or two desks or three desks and having a relatively small area. Um, you can either be working with um, the plastic bags. The plastic nursery bags used to be common. There's other plastic you know, things. Uh, trees for the Future switched entirely to biodegradable sacks for the trees that do need the sacks. And when we say the sacks, it's these little nursery bags. You fill them with soil and put the seed in. And those are very helpful. It's helpful for growing the seedlings and transporting them. And, um, but you, 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 can, you can plant trees even if you don't have those. I mean, you can start a bare root bed just like you would do a garden, just like you would grow carrots in a garden. You can start a bare root bed, you can prepare the soil, you can do your rows of seeds when it's moist and it rains, you can dig them up, you can transplant them. Um, but, but to really kind of re repeat and, and answer that question, the methodology on nurseries and all, um, we're training farmers. Best thing is not to give seedlings to farmers, is not to produce lots of seedlings in one place and then spend all season running back and forth with a pickup truck trying to you know, somehow distribute gazillions of trees to people now. Uh, it's to train farmers, train communities, to graze the seedlings. And then after just your average seedling spends about three months in the nursery, and then they're gonna outplant them in that first rainy season. So you're gonna look at whenever the rainy season date is um, and you back it out the right number of months, back it out three months or maybe four, four or five months if you need, to, need some more time to prepare your nursery. But I would do the training at that point. How do you spill the sacks? How do you, the most important thing in this whole process though, Filling the sacks is easy, mixing half soil with half compost or whatever your in re recipe is, that's the easy stuff. The most difficult thing, I'm looking for some seeds around here and I don't have some, is I would say germination, you know, and making sure that, a spe that, that, that farmers are learning to help make all of their seeds germinate. And so it's important to spend some time on that. Um, the planting, you know, is, is, is a little bit easier. Um, it's important to follow up though in that, that first week after the trees are planted, if anything dies, if the top of any tree is starting to kind of bend over just a little bit, you got to pull it out and replace it. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's almost like decentralizing the planting yeah. or nursery process is sure. then doing um, that and helping people be experimenters and learners from the beginning rather than from the middle of the process. I think that's really important and key as we talk about this. We had a couple different people asking about those methodologies, mass producing seedlings or direct seedling, you know, transplanting. And I think your answer kind of summarized all of that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about culture if the sure. community that someone's working with is primarily like used to slash and burn, how would they go about, you know, communicating the benefits of tree rearing to communities? Uh, I've, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years. And so I, I'll give you my, a, a little bit of the insights on, uh, I served in the Peace Corps in Senegal. And so that's a place where I, I for decades now, I've seen the change I went through from the first time we had to, it took like five minutes to say living fence because we're literally having to translate a fence that is alive. It's like, no, it's a fence that, you know, we're real, like linguistically struggling just to say, hey, would you like to plant a living fence? And they're like, what? Like, what do you, yeah. Um, and now fast forward 20 years later where it's the expectation where if you say the word fence in the peanut basin of Senegal, we're talking about a living fence. We're not talking about the old idea of cutting down trees to build a dead fence. And so it, it was kind of interesting to see that. Um, the extension is, extension and training farmers is, is a passion of mine. How do you find your early adopters at first? Uh, mm -hmm. As a Peace Corps volunteer, I was lucky to have a counterpart. In fact, Omar, I wish I had a picture of Omar around here somewhere, was my home state brother. He still works for us at Trees for the Future. Um, I, I was fortunate to have an early adopter that I was living with. Um, and I think finding your early adopters is, is there's probably book, entire books that are you know, written on how to do that. But um, my fifth guideline, market-based agroforestry, money talks. And so when you talk with farmers and say, how can trees help your lives? And I've done a, a gazillion focus groups. Farmers will consistently tell you food, money, and legacy. I need food to eat. I need money because we're poor and legacy, I'm, I'm getting old. 
and I look at my degraded plot of land and I see I don't have anything to pass to my kid. All I have to pass is this degraded plot of land and, a, and like a lifetime of labor. Like, and the kids are like, I am not interested in that at all. So tree planting and fruit trees is a, and hardwood trees and different things of real value is a way for, for farmers to pass incredible value from generation to generation and to help to help, you know, help the next up. So if you can pitch it uh, and help people see the market opportunity is, is gonna be absolutely critical. Yes, the environment, the environmental benefits and all that is always gonna be important. But at the end of the day, the communities that we work with have needs, they've got families and they got kids to send to school. Um, so I think tapping into the market-based stuff is certainly important at first. But um, I do remember when we were talking, I was, in, I was in the peanut basin of Senegal talking about the, the foray and there's no forest anywhere. Like there's no foray. So nobody, and there's brush land and stuff, but you bring in pictures and the videos weren't working too well because we've got older farmers and who are not used to learn. This is 2005 and we're looking at video screens and, you know, and trying to do all that. And people learn when, when we ended up finding the, um, the early adopters and the other people who really started getting it were doing great things. How did you decide to do what you're doing? Mustafa or whatever the farmer, there was always another guy. There was always another or woman who, who showed them the way. It was people to people. It was farmer to farmer at first. Um, I was not always the best salesman as the Peace Corps volunteer, but Omar was, and Omar continues to be. And 20 years later, Omar's planted tens of millions of trees. He's helped thousands of families rise and, and you know, because he was really, he was that early adopter and, and from him it was able to go. So I, I think that's, there's a lot in there. There's no easy way, uh, except for the market-based stuff. I think money talks in, in most situations and it's our, it's our pleasure to be able to bring some sustainable and regenerative enterprises to, to people who need it most. Yeah, um, I've seen it work through the, you know, lead farmer trainer idea and connecting. It's not, it's not because I tell you, it's because it's worked for me and you can see it. And so yeah. I think that's very powerful especially we, in trees and yeah it's i think it, it's it's it there's a science behind art and art and science behind that of uh, because uh, we deal with it too we've got training centers and we always try to make sure that we're not doing so much in our fancy training center that the farmer's saying hey wait i can't do that because over here on my farm i don't have the barbed wire or i don't have the solar panels or i don't have the whatever so um there is that kind of empowering finding the 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 um early adopters and and and, and working with them in ways so that they are not, you know, it's not, oh, well, you know, John gave you a thousand dollars. So of course your field is nice. Like I can't do that because John, you know, that's not the, that's not the thing. When other farmers were able to see that Omar did it on his own by planting the living fence. And, and after two years, he grew 12 different types of fruit trees in it. And then he bought a house. And then he bought a horse cart and then he bought a watch and a motorcycle when they see that. And, we, and it took a couple of years, you know, so you don't get easy, quick success on that if you're starting in a new zone. Um, but I think quality, quality is important, um, but also how you go about it. Um, we're all about groups now, though, um, especially women's groups, uh, the power of, of groups working together. So as much as we care about a family planting a forest garden, we really, really, really want to see um, so if I was going to go into a new community, I, I, I wouldn't just be looking for the early adopter, but I would like to see an early adopter who runs a group, you know, and, mm -hmm. and finding ways to work with women's groups and, and to kind of help us scale because we, we don't have time to be working with five or 10 or 15 people. We really need to find ways to get to the top of Apex organizations and, and, and scale everything that we talked about today a lot faster. Absolutely. And that came up in our topic about chickens for change is that working in a group gave you the kind of the cohort mentality and the community of talking to one another, you know, diagnosing challenges, but also just doing it in community, which is very important to so yeah. many cultures. They, they support um, so each other, about, they help each other out. Yeah, go ahead. So private, public or nonprofit work how does that differ when you're talking about tree projects or advantages or disadvantages? Um, 
Don't know. I mean, I think that the, the, there's there's a few different roles to play for everybody here. Um, you, you mentioned the chicken example. You just mentioned chickens, and I, I think so. We have all kinds of really interesting examples of market-based opportunities that that farmers have. Um, sometimes it's fruit. Sometimes it's nuts, berries, dried fruit. A big one for West Africa and a lot of the women across the uh, Great Green Wall is high value horticulture, lettuce, peppers, eggplant, and things like that. But sometimes when you're talking with, with, with communities or groups and you say, well, you know, what are your pain points? What are your needs? And I need food, I need fertilizer. But what are these market opportunities? And sometimes you hear uh, chickens is always popular. Chicken is big everywhere. Um, it's good protein, it's, it's fast, you can grow them, you got the eggs, you got the meat. Um, some of the best forage. So what are you gonna feed the chicken? Are you gonna buy maize-based, soy-based feed from the grocery store that has a huge carbon footprint? And in our program, we say, well, you've got chickens actually, if chickens is the thing, well, in your forest garden, there is a mix of soy and things and different things that'll give a, a, your average chicken uh, a, a enough feed or, or the nutritional stuff that, that, that the chicken needs. And it's probably, it's like maize and some legume and, and a couple other things mixed in. Um, in Kenya, as we're working with communities and we're saying, hey, you know, what do you need and what can you sell? The sell was milk. We've got a, a huge growing demand for milk, cheese, yogurt, and you say, well, what does milk have to do with the forest garden and tree planting? Well, when you ask the questions on, you know, what are the, what are the opportunities for, for, for people, you can usually find that forest gardens will make it all either more competitive or better. The thing with milk is um, in the communities where we're working in Kenya, uh, just about every family has two or three dairy cow. Um, and they're, that's a primary source of income. Well, rather than spending all of your money buying maize-based feed from the feed store, which is eating up 60% of your profit, um, you can grow your own animal feed, your cow feed with trees. And there's a lot of trees that you can grow in the agroforestry system in between the macadamia nuts, the coffee and other things. You've got Caliandra, which is another kind of pioneer, fast growing pioneer species that you can be feeding the cattle in the uplands of Kenya. Um, and they are, and there's, there's other species too. So now we say more milk, more money. Um, and so I think when you ask your question about nonprofit, for-profit, public sector, uh, we do want to put partnerships together. We want every, all three to be able to kind of use and flex their strengths uh, in, in these types of partnerships. In my presentation earlier, I talked about how a company, a, the private sector company, wanted to use its money to say, we want to plant trees, but then they they did it in a way that they had to kind of put a fence around it and keep the community out. And so that's uh, a, a bad example, but there's so many better examples of private sector doing what we really need. And when we talk about growing a great green wall, we're trying to talk about grown in the great green wall and, how, and, and, and we're uh, encouraging private enterprise and the private sector to help us do market development of agroforestry crops you know, across these zones that, that we're trying to uh, restore. And as we're trying to restore with forest gardens and agroforestry, sometimes it's shea, which has come up a few times and that needs to be processed and turned into lotions and sold. And sometimes it's mangoes that can be dried and or it's the chickens and there's all kinds of opportunities there or it's, we're gonna keep running into livestock as well as we work across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa to grow the Great Green Wall across it. And um, so the private sector, I think, has, has plenty of opportunities for, um, you know, supporting people in important ways and also investing on the input side and seeds and credit uh, that people need. Uh, for our, our public sector, the governments that we work with, Trees of the Future, sometimes we're, we're usually working with agriculture or forestry sector um, ministries in, in, in the various countries where we're working. There's seldom an, an agroforestry department, except in a place like uh, uh, Philippines, I believe, has agroforestry departments and, you know, specialization and all, and you don't always find that. Uh, I think you do find it in Jamaica um, and, and some other places, but um, the public sector is, uh, you know, has its role to play too in terms of bringing all the stakeholders together in a town and across a food system. Um, they're, they're, they're supporting a lot of the nutritional uh, initiatives 
in the zone uh, while the private sector is trying to help help farmers connect to markets. And uh, and here we are, we're the social sector, we're the nonprofits. And I think, you know, we, we, we have a lot to learn from the private sector in terms of thinking like businessmen, business women, business people, and being efficient and effective with our money and, and thinking about market-based agroforestry. Um, but I think we also bring um, important values into the discussion. And we make sure that agriculture doesn't turn into agribusiness and that agriculture mm -hmm. keeps its culture and that people keep their culture. And, and we're very attuned to that so that we can have some sustainable development. Um, I, uh, I think I've had a lot more, you know, private sector is always ready to move faster and they have money. Uh, the public sector is very important though, uh, especially if we're working in, in, in the countries where many of you are working and you, you're talking about the local ag extension agent or the local forestry official and you wanna be able to help bring some training and resources and things like that into them as well. Um, but uh, yeah. Any follow up on that? I think that I think there's there's there might be some people. I see a couple of names in this group that would love to talk about, um, you know, public private partnerships and, and different things that, that we have. Yeah, that question was from Tyler. So we want to make sure we answered it thoroughly. Um, and I know Tyler is working on some projects. Um, He's welcome to own. send a follow up. Sure. I'm sure there's a lot to. Absolutely. Unpack. So um, we're going to go next and bolts again for a little while. Um, any advice as to the use of high tunnels, shade houses, net houses in your backyard nurseries? Uh, you know, we haven't, and I actually, I, I'm, I really don't see it much at all. I, I see the, our nurseries are always simple. Um, they're, they're just uh, either polypots or biodegradable sacks, you know, in different types of beds. We have bare root beds as well. Um, I guess, you know, if, if you have the tunnels, you might be think, thinking more about um, seedlings that stay in nursery over a year. And we don't have too many of those. And I guess at our training centers where we're doing with grafted seedlings, we might find a little bit more effort in any of those tunnels or anything, but not with our farmers. I, 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 we, you know, we try to avoid plastic, rubber and metal as much as possible. Um, we got good tools, but you know, a lot of the, the, um, the things will kind of degrade after a year or two or three. The stuff that we provide farmers will be some of the pots. We'll give them a couple of watering cans. We will give them some tree seeds, um, a rake or a shovel head, and maybe a wheelbarrow. Um, sometimes there's a specialized, um, in a place that has a lot of rain and like boots, are pretty essential just for kind of getting stuff done in the rainy season. We might provide something like that as well, um, but we haven't. It's a good question about nurseries. We're trying to, you know, we're trying. We've, we're always we're, we're planting 50, over 50 million trees this year with over 40,000 people, and we're trying to keep the cost per tree as low as as we possibly can, uh, so that we can you know help more people and plant more trees. So it's um, we we haven't explored too much in terms of the additional uh, technology on nurseries and, and we try to keep it super appropriate. Uh, so I, well, I, I appreciate learning anything on, on more propagation methods that any of you have um, that, are, that are like this, but not a whole lot on tunnels. I think um, if you get into horticulture though, is all the work that I've done in terms of producing tomatoes and hot peppers and everything else in tunnels and things like that, I, I think there's certainly a, a financial case to be made for them and you can be producing seedlings in them as well. So that's more than a thousand trees per person this year. How is that yeah. even possible? Yeah, yeah, it's it's fun. Uh, the first year in the living fence, they'll often plant three rows in the living fence around their field, and then at least three alleys across the field. Uh, so you might be planting, you know, two thousand trees in that first year, and, and most of your trees in that first year too. Um, and uh, you know, and hopefully, if, if a family is able to fulfill all of their own forest garden needs, if they have a hectare or an acre, some are doing an acre. I think the average is about an acre. Some people are doing a hectare, tw two acres. Um, but if they finish the first in the first year, they're able to kind of move on to the second one as well. So we have farmers who might do the first one, then do the second one. I know people who are moving on to the third one as well. Um, so it, it yeah, works. Amazing. You know, if you have like, if you own three plots of land, there's usually one plot that's closest to the village. The next one is a little bit of a hike. And then the third one, which is, you know, kind of pretty far away. And so usually start with the plot of land that you own that's closest to the village. Nail that one, cover it, living fence, fruit trees, alleys, permagarden, compost, and then move on to the next one. 
So Lonnie had a great question about tools that work best with this work. You mentioned shovels or, or rake heads. Um, can any of them be made at the local village or regional level? And do you offer those kinds of guides? We do. We always try to buy them locally. As we grow as an organization, it was it was easier to buy a hundred rake head, rake, you know, shovel heads from the local market. Uh, now that we need to buy a thousand, we need to start looking differently. But I think this procurement has always been very important for us. In Kafreen, we buy as much as we can from Kafreen, city of Kafreen. In Fatik, Senegal, we buy as much as we can there. And in Homa Bay, Kenya, we're trying to source as much as we can locally. Sometimes you do need to find the the main distributors, but um. Well, the most interesting example. So, my so two two things real quick. My brother, not Omar. So Omar is my homestay brother. I mentioned Omar's name a couple of times. He still works for Trees of the Future. Omar's little brother, Ibu, he's a metal worker. So he used to do tools and rakes and stuff like that. Now he's graduated onto beautiful doors and other things as well. Um, but I have seen, you know, even people I know who are helping to produce things for the program. Uh, but the most wonderful example that we saw was in the internet, uh, was in the Central African Republic, which is a place where Trees for the Future is working with the International Rescue Committee. And Central African Republic has a, a pretty bad conflict problem. They've got nine or so squads across the country that are, that are causing a lot of problems. Um, and I know that there's some people in the echo community who uh, I, I was there, I was like, hey, fruit trees, we need fruit tree varieties. And so, um, but that was a place where uh, the, the women's groups that we were working with were also working directly with the, uh, the metal workers who I went to the scrap yards. I have to share this stuff through Instagram again. Uh, going to the scrap yards and seeing people pulling apart cars and tearing things apart and, and then put, and then we've got forks and uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, uh, pitchforks and shovels and all these other kind of farming tools that were recreated and hammered out. And then we were purchasing all of them from the women's groups and even and scissors and stuff like that too. So it was really exciting to be able to uh, see it. I, I appreciate uh, the question there. And I think we definitely want to encourage that whenever possible. Some of the stuff is cheap uh, plastic stuff, uh, watering cans, cheap wheelbarrows that, that get imported, but, but oftentimes with some of the hand tools that somebody asked about there, I think it's a great example where you can kind of support some of the local economy. Uh, seeds is another big one. I think there's more, there's a lot of money in seeds too. So we're trying to work with as many of our, our, our women's groups, our cooperatives to work on seed production, tree seed production, vegetable seed production, so we can source it from them as well. So in addition to the tools, I think the seeds is a, is a consistent money maker for people to, or can be if, 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 if they get into it. Absolutely. So one specific question was your reference to the statistic about losing a third of our topsoil. Um, can you talk a little bit about that idea and where that came from? I wish I don't know the specific one. We usually pull our stuff from some of the IP, IPCC reports and, and some of the other uh, kind of leading environmental reports. So there's been a, a couple that have come out right now. So I'm pretty sure it was a talking point from one of them. Um, when we think about our topsoil, we look at what it, we see with our own eyes as you go to Haiti. So if you go to West Africa, you go to East Africa, you go to Haiti, you go, go to the south, I mean, climb up the hill, go to the south and the hill, go to Valu or some of these other places I had the great pleasure of visiting. You see that trees were degraded. The rocks that are now showing from the mountainsides are essentially the bones of the mountains. And the, the, the surface has so long been, been eroded that the topsoil has been long gone. Uh, the topsoil in Senegal has long been e degraded and eroded uh, from peanut farming for the last 70, 70 years. So what we're seeing is really not even topsoil anymore. It's, it's the sub layers of soil that were growing you know, peanuts in and, and different things like that. Um, when you look at the soils and how heavily they've been degraded and burned over the years. Um, oof, uh, sorry, I even forget the question, Danielle. Yeah, we were talking about degraded soils. Yes, and how that's figured. Um, I did want to tell everybody in the session right now that we are um, wrapping up the conference. If you wanted to pop out and head to that session, you're welcome to go there. Uh, we are almost done here with all the questions, but if you have any burning questions for John, we want to address those as well. So please be sure to put those in the Q&A and we'd be happy to discuss those. But if you wanna get over to the closing ceremony, 
um, you're welcome to do that. So yeah, I mean, it's hard. You think about like tons and tons of topsoil loss. It's a huge issue, but it's hard to like calculate that on a smaller scale and really know here what that US, looks like. Yeah, here in the US, we have, you know, nine meters of thick topsoil that was created by the glaciers. And it's just like, it's, it's so much topsoil. Um, but in the developing world where they probably started out with something very thin, it's, it's very much long been degraded and eroded and, and agriculture exposed it. The constant storms keep eroding it. And um, uh, yeah, it's, it's you know, a, a lot of people talk, we're not, we're not tree planters, we're real soil farmers more. We're really here to keep soils healthy and, and soils are the basis of all we do. So we certainly do recognize that. We've got a lot of work to do. These soils are so degraded that it's, it's hard. So Michael had a question, any experience or recommendations for incorporating multipurpose trees with cover crops to accelerate soil restoration? Yeah, cover crops. Um, I came down to, I guess it was a couple of few years ago and I came home, I was so juiced to roll out some more cover cropping initiatives after what I learned at ECHO. Um, we, we, we have, we've talked with a few people in the ECHO community as well uh, over the last couple of years. And I know there's like two or three really good cover crops. Um, our discussions though, with the cover crop, people have been working on it. It, it did keep kind of keep coming back to Glira City CPM and some of the trees that, that, are, that are used with those cover crops. I, I do hope to see a lot more of that. Um, I think through COVID in the last year and a half, the, the cover crops took a little bit of a backseat in terms of priorities, but um, it's it's absolutely missing. Like I really don't see it at all. And it, it, it makes so much sense to, to really pack in as much biomass in the off season and to protect the crops. If, uh, if, if there's running water, we definitely want farmers to continue doing market gardening in the off season and keep working the thing. But most, you know, that's all, that's a really small part of the land in the off season. Most of the rest of it really should be covered with a lot of thick, you know, vegetative cover. And um, so we're absolutely interested if, if you all do have some expertise and, and want to connect and, and to help us jump that learning curve, uh, we uh, wholeheartedly welcome it. But um, I wish I had more, more to report on our end besides a desire. No, oh, yeah. that's okay. If someone does have questions about cover crops, ECHO does have a cover crop selector tool on ECHO community yeah. and on the app to help people kind of prioritize whether they're looking for animal food or people food and elevations and rainfall and just to start somewhere. Um, and then the last question is kind of a cultural question. Have you come across um, experience with people not wanting to fence in their land because it looks selfish or rude or isn't culturally appropriate for their people group? Um, I, I, I've seen funny, uh, not funny things, but, but different interpretations of the living fence and, and who, who's protecting who from what. Um, I don't think I've seen the hesitate. I think people are hesitant to do something new that nobody's ever done before and to fail in front of their neighbors. And they're like, dude, what did you do? You planted what around your field? Like, what are you wasting? You know, there is that fear. I haven't seen the um, kind of like, I'm gonna put a fence around my house right now. I'm a little nervous to ask my neighbors and say, I'm gonna put up a fence, but I hope you don't mind. I don't see that. What I've learned about the interesting part of the living fence is usually we think about planting it to keep people out, but we've had a lot of examples working with herders in Tanzania and Kenya um, and I want to say Chad as well, where they wanted to plant the living fences to keep their animals in because they, they don't want their animals going out and doing, you know, and messing up things or going into other things. So I, I have seen that kind of nature of, of different people planting living fences for different reasons, whether keep the animals in or keep other animals out, other people's animals out. Um, but uh, I haven't. I, I welcome if anybody else has had that type of experience. But uh, the border of a field, if you go to the average farm, especially a monocropped farm, the border is usually the least used real estate on the farm. Like that's where the plow essentially turns around and comes back and there's really nothing growing on the two or three or four or five feet there, like on, on the edge of the field, or maybe they kind of grew up to the edge. But with this living fence idea, there is the, the wall, 
that it that it forms. But oftentimes people start realizing they're like, oh, I make I'm making fifty or a hundred dollars off of the jujubes that are growing off of my living fence. And that's an extra hundred dollars I never had before, you know, produced from land that never really even produced anything for me before too. So there's a good, and the transformational nature before, as I said, then you can start doing something real inside that's more valuable and more interesting right. and more rewarding. And so I, I think all of the, the pros out, out, out the, the cons on that, but I appreciate the question, yeah. So Tyler did come back with a clarifying question about the nonprofit for profit oh, yeah. area. Um, he said one of his biggest challenges is that people really aren't committed in the first place and they're just trying to get stuff for free because of historical work in the area. And he said with encouraging people to plant trees on a larger scale, how do you get people who are committed and willing to follow through when things get hard? Because it's often much more work than people think. Um, so he's try thinking maybe he just hasn't found his early adopters yet, but um, the reality is it does take quite a bit of work to get going. And, you know, how do you communicate the investment of this benefit? Yeah, it's, it is hard. There's a, there's so many different people, cultural, sustainable design. There's, there's so many different factors in it. Um, if you're in a place that has and Haiti, Haiti is one of them um, that has such a long history of NGOs and projects in it. Um, or if you're in a zone of a country that's particularly close to the capital city and that has a, a long history of decades of a lot of development work and projects, uh, it's hard. It's sometimes hard to find the right partners uh, because a lot of people are there playing the game or, or um, in smaller villages, people usually say you have more, more success in a smaller village, they're underserved, they haven't had as much projects, they're a little bit more remote. And so um, one way is, is to find smaller villages, but we are looking to scale. So we want more people, not, not less, but uh, a village has a hundred people, 200, 300. And if they haven't had projects, I, I think you'll find, you know, that, that they're gonna be a, a lot more, I'd say appreciative, but ready to take advantage of the project when it comes. Um, Picking the who is tough. If you're an outsider, you don't know the who, you don't know who the workers are. And I think that, you know, it's, it's good to have smart ideas here, but it, it, you know, it's, it's important to, I remember my homestay dad, Omar's, Omar's dad, he unfortunately, he passed away this past Christmas. And by Modu was, he was, he was a tough tree planter and he was a tough dude. And he did the call to prayer in the village. He was my homestay father, he did the call to prayer. Um, but he was the guy in the beginning. He said, you spent all day hanging out with Mustafa today. And he's like, I'm sorry, but Mustafa's not a worker. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, I need you to understand that we have workers in this community. I know who they are. I respected my dad and, and he knew, and he was one of the workers. And I, you know, I think kind of understand, you know, as, as, a, as a Peace Corps volunteer or as an outsider, it's hard to to pick the right people and all. And I, I think the more that you can find the local champions who, who, who know, how to navigate that, you know, the better. Um, I think people's motivation is tough. People say that they're motivated and how do you know and how do you assess that? Probably unpack that a lot more. Um, yeah. yeah. Maybe next year at conference, we can talk a bit more about We're gonna that. have to, we're gonna have to, that's right. That's right, right. yeah. No, we appreciate your time. We have one last question. Um, it's pretty a quick one. The first year when the living fence and alleys are planted, does the farmer still plant his traditional row crop, his or her crop? Yeah, usually. And you want to encourage him or her to grow uh, crops that hopefully aren't going to like pull the trees down. Millet is one that if it gets too thick and dense, it just suffocates everything and it blocks out too much because it, it grows and it's got the, you know, so millet um, maybe there's types of millet, you know, that, that might be better. Um, you know, if, if you're going to do a bean or a bush bean, it's probably better. If you're going to plant your trees, but also do peanuts, and then you got some 18 year old kid who's going to be dragging a, a, a hoe, you know, through that field, tearing up your trees or something like that. So you do need to be a little careful about what crop you do, but it's a transition. People aren't ready to just stop the old thing and jump into the new. You're, you're right in your questioning here too, was you know you plant your living fence, plant your alleys. You can still do your crop the first year. And if that farmer just has one foot in the program and isn't ready to fully you know, dedicate himself or herself, then, then that's okay and they'll do it. And then, and then transition, 
But what you'll expect over a few years is as those fruit trees grow, then that farmer's making more money off the fruit trees and phasing out, you know, phasing out the other stuff.